Welcome to Washington Hospital Today, dedicated to informing residents about healthcare topics and issues. Through programs featuring community forums and free health and wellness classes, our goal is to empower community members with the information needed to make informed health decisions. Washington Hospital has been providing health care to the residents of the Washington Township Healthcare District for the past 60 years. Hello and welcome. Today's presentation, Enlarged Prostate, Causes, Symptoms, and Treatment, is presented by Dr. Mark Shu. Dr. Shu is a urologist with Washington Township Medical Foundation. He is a Bay Area native and earned his medical degree from Stanford University School of Medicine. He specializes in diagnosing and treat, treating conditions of the urinary tract and the male reproductive system. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Mark Shu. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Mark Shu, and I'm a urologist at the Washington Township Medical Foundation uh, in Fremont, California, associated with Washington Hospital. Thank you for joining me today on this educational talk about the prostate and how its enlargement can cause urinary issues. An enlarged prostate is one of the most common issues that an older man can deal with in their uh, golden years. And uh, very likely, if you have a urinary issue at that time, more than likely than not, it's the prostate. To give you an overview of our talk tonight, uh, first talk about the prostate, its anatomical considerations, and the role in the urinary system. Uh, next, we'll talk about how its enlargement can cause uh, urinary bother, and we'll call that PPH from here on out, just to simplify things. And finally, we'll go over some of the treatment options that urologists can offer. Uh, for traditionally, we've, been, we've uh, talked about medications and surgery as the traditional options that have been offered. Um, but in the last five to ten years, there have been a couple of uh, pretty exciting uh, uh, new procedures that have been offered in the minimally invasive area um, that are kind of like a niche uh, in an in-between of medications and surgery. And we'll talk about a couple of them today, um, both of which we offer here in our clinic. So what is the prostate? It's typically a walnut-sized gland, and it sits at the base of uh, the bladder. And there's a channel within the prostate, and I'll show you right here. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a hole that goes through the prostate, and we call that the prostatic urethra. And that's the area that the urine in the bladder has to exit uh, through this area before it be able, is able to come out through the urethra. And so um, that's the area of focus that we'll, we'll be referring to quite a bit. And uh, otherwise, the prostate produces about a third of the volume of the ejaculate. And there's two main stages of growth. Um, one, in it, it reaches its adult size in the 20s, uh, in your 20s, and then uh, it will continue to grow from your mid-40s onwards through the rest of uh, your life. And so uh, there are several pro problems that can happen with the prostate that would lead one to seek medical attention. And here are three of the most common conditions that uh, the prostate can, uh, can, uh, can, one can encounter. And the first one is, is BPH, which is the one we're going to be talking about today. Um, but there's also other conditions like prostatitis in the middle there, which is uh, basically an infection or inflammatory condition of the prostate. And then there's also prostate cancer. Um, there can be some overlap in, uh, in, in, these, in symptoms between these three conditions. So it's important for the urologist to, to, to be able to evaluate you and through the workup kind of figure out which one it is. Um, but a, good, but a good point to make, though, is that uh, they're, they're, they're completely independent of each other. And one does not necessarily mean you're going to get the other. So a very common question I'll get from men will be, well, if my prostate is larger, will I have an increased risk of prostate cancer? And the answer is no. There's people with small uh, prostates or large prostates that can get prostate cancer. So that's not, a, not, not, the, not the issue there. So let's focus on what BPH stands for, because it's pretty aptly named. So if we look at the B, it stands for benign. So again, that's non-cancerous. We're not talking about cancer in this situation. P is referring to the prostate. And H is hyperplasia. So that's the medical term for more cells. So more cells means it's, it becomes enlarged just by, by mass. Okay, so the, the normal size of the prostate is about 20 to 25 grams, give or take. 
And when it gets bigger, you know, that's when anatomically it can cause what's a phenomenon we call in medicine bladder outlet obstruction. And, and that can then lead to, to urinary symptoms, which we also call lower urinary tract symptoms or simply LUTs. So BPH is the most common reason for what we call this bladder, uh, what we call bladder outlet obstruction. And so what I like to describe what the prostate does in this enlargement is this donut hole analogy. So if we look at the left side here in the normal prostate anatomy diagram, again, we have the, the bladder here and the prostate here in that channel, that prostate urethra going through. So this is the normal state of things, but in a, in a large prostate situation, the prostate both grows outwards on, towards the side, but also inwards towards the middle. And so if you imagine that donut hole is getting smaller because that, um, that tube in the prostate is, is becoming tighter. So over time, that bladder's got to work really hard to squeeze that urine through this tight little channel. And you can imagine, now the bladder is actually a muscle. So if the muscle's got to squeeze really hard, work over time for many years, you can imagine what's going to happen. It's starting to become very thick. Um, and and uh, you can see in this diagram back here, it's what we call a trabeculated bladder. It'll, it will look... Uh, very thickened if you were to put a camera inside. So what are the, the symptoms of uh, BPH? Now, we usually divide that in medicine into two categories, one being obstructive and the other being irritative. So obstructive basically is what it sounds like, like a weaker stream, it takes a little while to get started, you may not feel completely empty. Um, and then irritative is more like the frequency, like you have to go all the time, you feel like you, you, can't, hold, you can't hold it for very long, um, you're waking up at night a lot. Um, these are all, um, all possible symptoms of BPH, and they can be any constellation of those. I mean, we can hear any, any uh, combination of these uh, symptoms when we talk to patients. So this uh, slide just goes over some statistics of surveys, a quality of life surveys of men with BPH that have had the, you know, that talk about how their, their, their urinary symptoms affect their quality of life. So, um, you know, I, patients come to see me, I've heard a lot of different stories. I mean, most common ones I'll mention here will be like golfers who will tell me they have to find a restroom every few holes. And, uh, you know, that's already, a dist you know, heck, golf is a really tough game in itself already. So it's not like you need any more distractions, right? And then you have self-conscious guys at the urinal um, who are hearing all these young whippersnappers next to them with like laying loose with their good streams. And then there's other people who like know exactly where the, every single bathroom is on their, their route, you know, to and from work or to their, to their errands. Um, so, so this, this is, this is kind of what, what we will hear in the clinic. And it's not just, you know, the patients themselves that have to go through these issues, but also their significant others or their loved ones or, people around them that also get to vicariously uh, go through these issues as well. So uh, VPH is a very common issue. Like we're saying, it's the most common prostate issue for men over 50. And as you know, people get older and older, that prostate will continue to grow with time and more has a higher chance of causing uh, a urinary bother issue. And you know, just even as you know, recent as 10 years ago, like there was 14 million men that had uh, bothersome LUTs because of the prostate. And um, you know, th there's about 10 to 20% of men that would eventually need a procedural intervention for BPH. Um, and there's some, there's some link that potentially obesity and lack of exercise may increase the risk of progressive BPH. So you know, just like what all the doctors are saying, the importance of a good diet and exercise and stress management, all these things you know, play into many parts of uh, one's health, and, and, that, and then that definitely includes the prostate. So if you were to come to the urology clinic, this is the, typically the arsenal of the workup that we have. Uh, first, we will take a detailed history, kind of get, understand what kind of symptoms that are going on, and we have some surveys that we can do to kind of quantify to get some objective numbers about how bothered one is. Uh, we'll do a prostate exam where um, we'll, we'll take a feel of the size of the prostate and the texture of how it feels. And then, uh, and then we also will typically also conduct some urine studies to make sure there's no obvious infection, that there's no blood in the urine that requires further workup. Um, one of the tests that we also, also offer 
um, uh, is is what's called a PSA. And now I'm sure many of you many of you have heard about the PSA, which stands for a prostate specific antigen. And this is you know somewhat controversial about it, how 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 tightly to screen for it. And this could be really its own lecture, you know, in its own right. There's so much to talk about with that. But you know, for the purposes of this talk, it's a good screening tool, I would say. And definitely, a urologist needs to be available to interpret that trend over time. You know, the PSA can have some false positives and false negatives that can go up with things like prostate cancer, which we definitely would have to evaluate for if that was a high enough suspicion. But also, PSAs can also go up with enlarging prostate because actually, at the end of the day. The prostate is what makes the PSA. Um, finally, there's some studies we can do, like a, I, I call this a speed test or the Euroflow you see on the screen there. Euroflow is just basically a, a simple thing where I have a man urinate into the, a funnel that has a speedometer on it, and then we can basically chart uh, the time and the velocity. So that way we can kind of get a nice speed curve and see the efficiency of how well one urinates. And then uh, there are some procedural things that we can also do, one being a, a cystoscopy, which is basically the medical term for placing a camera into the bladder. So we can really look at the anatomy of the, the prostate and that bladder and see how trabeculated it is. You know, so, 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 so seeing to ex what extent that bladder has been working for to try to get that urine through the, pro uh, through the prostate. And also we have what's called a, a transrectal ultrasound of the prostate where we can do that to get a little bit more anatomic detail and also to measure the prostate size. So most of the time when patients come to see me, it's, it's mainly quality of life issues that we address. And, then, and you know, again, it, my job is to make sure the objective data looks okay. That doesn't drive me to do something sooner. But there are some worst case scenarios where definitely my attention would be peaked and we would I would definitely be recommending that we do something sooner. Um, there are a few situations that are listed here that if the, pro the enlarged prostate is untreated, it can really lead to significant medical problems that can, can affect uh, one's health. I think the worst case would be if you, know, you weren't able to empty at all. If the bladder is so weak that it can't even squeeze any urine past the prostate, so it's just you have a distended bladder, that is what we call urinary retention. So you're not able to pee, you need to have something like a catheter, for example, which is the most common way to be able to sufficiently am empty the bladder. Now this is, this is undetected, this, uh, this can lead to what's called renal failure. So basically that urine has nowhere else to go because it can't make it through the prostate, so it basically goes backward, backwards up into the kidney, and basically the, the kidneys drown in their own urine, and that can cause what's called renal failure, and that's definitely very bad. Um, other issues that uh, can happen can be like UTIs, where uh, if you have a nice um, warm urine that's sitting in the bladder that can't get out, that's a nice uh, medium for bacteria to grow in and cause problems that way. And there's also a lot of calcium salts in urine that if it just stays there for a long time, not, empty, not able to empty well, that can come together over time and form bladder stones. And that doesn't sound like fun either, right? So, um, and finally, the, the bottom thing is called bladder dysfunction. I want to show you guys in this diagram here. So uh, when I talk about the trabeculated bladder, there's a schematic here about how that can progress over time. So, here is a, what we call a healthy bladder, where the, the, the bladder wall looks very smooth. I would say smooth like a baby's bottom. But as you kind of get to like a medium kind of sized uh, uh, picture here with, with bladder worsening and thickening, uh, you see sort of some, see some of these ridges that show this bladder muscle thickening here. And in the worst case, you get this basically this big thick cobweb of uh, bladder muscle fibers. And this can really show that a bladder can, you know, this, this place, the bladder is at risk for not being able to squeeze very well, or is this really spastic bladder that's just going to be squeezing so very often. And this can sometimes be a permanent situation despite what you do to the prostate at that point. So anyways, these, these, are, these are all certain, certain examples of situations where, you know, uh, as a urologist, you would, if you saw that situation, you would want to consider uh, early intervention much more aggressively earlier on. So now we'll go over the last part, the last section of the talk where we're talking about BPH treatment options. And there's a huge spectrum here. So we can go from what's called watchful waiting or you know, making sure that everything in the lifestyle is as optimized as possible. And then there's like first line therapies. We're talking about medications and potentially some of these minimally invasive procedures. And finally, there's more, sur more aggressive surgical therapies there. So again, for most people with more quality of life issues, you, know, you the patient are the boss. And you, you, know, you, you dictate what 
uh, what we want to do. And I'm your, your counselor in a way and basically telling you all the pros and cons of the options and uh, making sure that there's nothing medically you know, dangerous or threatening that's going on that would let, let me to make a stronger recommendation towards a more aggressive therapy. So the first um, treatment option is watchful waiting. So this is basically where we're looking at your lifestyle and making sure that everything is as optimized as possible uh, in, in one's daily habits. And uh, one of the most common things I like to do in my patients is get what's called a void diary. And so uh, this basically is very simple. I just have somebody treat, uh, chart what they drink, you know, basically the amount and what they're drinking and at what time. And then when they pee, I have them pee into a container and, and measure how much comes out. And then they write down you know, how often that's coming out and what is coming out. So that way I can see you know, if there's something adjustments that to be made in terms of how much, like for example, caffeine or alcohol they're drinking. Sometimes people are drinking lots of coffee and tea and you, say, and you see a cluster of frequency go on along with that. On the other side, you say, okay, well maybe try to cut down on the coffee and tea in this part of the day and see if that might help you with their symptoms. Um, and also uh, there's other things we can do, for example, like, uh, uh, like watching how much you, you know, making sure simply that you don't drink that much before you go to bed. That can also potentially reduce how, much, uh, how many episodes you wake up at night. Um, there are other things we can also check too, like you know, medication review. There are actually some medications that can, can, have, that can have side effects that uh, can make it harder for one to urinate. So if we, don't want, we can try to avoid that, then we only want to be able to catch that. Um, there are some uh, exercises that we can offer to patients, like uh, Kegel exercises, or what we call purposeful double voiding for select patients where you can, you know, in some situations, if someone's really bothered by frequency and urgency, that they can try to strengthen their pelvic muscles so they can resist that initial urgency to pee. Or for someone who's not emptying very well, you tell them to pee and then wait about 15 to 20 seconds and then try to pee again. So that really just gives them that extra uh, uh, effort to try to empty as much as possible. So if uh, patients are bothered despite you know, trying to optimize their lifestyle, then we can offer uh, medical therapy. And the most common medication that we'll start with is what's called an alpha blocker. And what this does is that it tries to relax that, that area in the, pros the that prostatic urethra that we talked about, that donut hole. Trying, there's receptors in, in, uh, in the uh, prostatic urethra uh, that can respond to this medication and cause that muscle to relax and open out to the side. So that donut hole relaxes and gets a little bigger makes it easier for that urine to come from the bladder through the prostate. Um, so that's been really the first thing that we've been, we'll usually offer to patients, and there can be some side effects to that medication. Um, so one of them is that it can lower the blood pressure. Um, so we have to be careful if we're taking other blood pressure medications to be aware of that. Um, sometimes people can complain some dizziness if they stay up too quickly. Um, these, there are some alpha receptors in other parts of the body, for example, in the nose. So some people could complain of a stuffy nose. Okay. So, and then one of the other considerations with an alpha blocker is that it can be associated with a phenomenon called retrograde ejaculation. And this is a, uh, kind of like sexual side effect. So usually when you have an orgasm, when a man has an orgasm, there's, there's fluid that comes out, uh, uh in the semen, right? So. But if, it's, if this area is really relaxed, then that, air, that semen could actually go backwards through that prostatic urethra into the bladder. It's nothing dangerous that urine and semen mix, and then later on you pee it. It's basically a mix of urine and sperm uh, and semen. Um, but it can be you know, a bothersome side effect for, for sexually active men. Another uh, medication that we can offer is what's called a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. And uh, what this does is a, it uh, inhibits the formation of a powerful form of testosterone called dihydrotestosterone. And taken over several months, this can actually reduce the prostate by about 25%. And um, there was a landmark study that came out in 2003 called the MTOP study, where they showed that if you, if you combine this medication with an alpha blocker, it could reduce your uh, potential need for surgery by up to 25%. So as you can imagine, I mean, if it works by shrinking the prostate, that donut hole will potentially get bigger, right? So, so, uh, so that's been a pretty effective medication as well. There are some, there are some drawbacks, though, and, and, and the side effect profile is 
typically in the, the sexual arena, where uh, there, there can be a phenomenon called post finasteride syndrome that some people can get from taking this medication. And that can manifest with like, you know, uh, worse erections, a lower libido, the retrograde ejaculation phenomenon. So these are, you know, these are things that we have to be aware of. And another thing that's also of interest is that it lowers the PSA by 50%. So that prostate cancer screening test that we talked about earlier. Um, that doesn't mean your risk of prostate cancer went down by 50%. It's just that we have to take that into account when we're following your PSA on that medication. So now we'll talk about some of the minimally invasive uh, therapies that we offer here and, and, and also has been, you know, become more popular in the last several years. The first one is called Resume. Resume is an outpatient clinic-based therapy where we basically inject water vapor into those obstructive parts of the prostatic urethra and into the prostate tissue. And that heat energy is absorbed by the prostate. And after several weeks, you'll get a regression effect where the prostate tissue on the inside recedes out to the sides. So again, making that donut hole bigger. That's, all, that's the whole goal of all these therapies. Um, it's, a, it's a quick procedure. It usually just takes several minutes, honestly, once we get started. A lot of the work actually comes in the preparation and then cleaning up. But the procedure time is actually relatively short on the scan, span of several minutes. And we'll leave a catheter for a few days. Um, and then we'll tell people to wait usually about two to four weeks for the effects to take place as that, again, that, that prostate tissue recovers from the heat. So there can be some side effects like some blood in the urine, some frequency, some urgency, some burning in with urination that are common um, as, as the prostate recovers from that. Um, it's been, it has been a pretty uh, well-validated uh, uh, procedure, and um, you know, they've come out, the, the company that sponsors Resume did show five-year data showing the vast majority of people are still satisfied with symptoms that 4.4% you know, of people need treatment after five years. So um, this is one of the promising therapies that are available today. And here's just to show you how the Resume works. So basically, on this left side of the diagram here, you have the water that's in the bag here. It then goes through a tube through here, the generator. And then here's actually our delivery instrument uh, with here with the lens that you can see. So the lens here in the middle part here goes through the prostate, and we identify those parts of the prostate that are obstructive. And then we do these nine-second treatments where we're rejecting every centimeter of that obstructive prostate tissue with this, this uh, water vapor. And uh, this, this basically works through convection heat, and it's, the energy is distributed evenly uh, throughout the prostate tissue. And so here in the last part of the, on the right side of the diagram, you have the before and after, where you know, again, you have this obstructed prostate with the tight prostatic urethra here, and after the treatments, after usually about four to six weeks, you see that, you know, that, that, that effect, that treatment effect where the prostatic urethra opens up to the side. So some potential benefits of Resume are is that it has, it has a minimal risk for sexual side effects. So very, very small risk for uh, worse erections afterwards. I counsel patients about there's only about a 5% risk for this retrograde ejaculation effect where no semen comes out with orgasm. Um, the recovery is on the relatively quick side. I tell people usually to restrict activities for about a week. Um, I, have, I have used this off-label on some patients who are not able to urinate because of severe BPH, and they were able to urinate afterwards. And my goal also is to be able to stop the medication. So if someone's taking medications to respond to it, and after the treatment, they, they say they feel better. My goal is to stop their medications at about a month afterwards. Another final uh, good point about Resume is that it does leave options on the table. So let's say we do this treatment, and then potentially in several years, if, if the tissue were to regrow, I mean, it leaves your, you can still go back to medications. You can consider another uh, minimally invasive therapy, or you could consider a surgical therapy uh, as a next step. So it really doesn't really burn any bridges. Another minimally invasive option that we also offer is what's called a prostatic urethral lift. And this is a mechanical strategy to, trying to, open, to try to open up that prostatic urethra. So it's, again, a clinic-based um, outpatient procedure that, where we're basically using these metal clips to open up that prostatic tissue um, that's, that's obstructive. 
um, so that's not blocking the, the, the bladder anymore. Um, so some potential side effects of this can be, um, you know, with, with the implants of this can cause some, you know, frequency and urgency and burning with urination, similar to that first procedure we discussed, some blood in the urine, uh, potential incrustation if it's improperly placed. Um, and, you know, I, I like to look at the prostate and make sure um, that the anatomy and where we're trying to push open this tissue looks like it has a reasonable chance of success. And so looking at this diagram here, um, basically this is the delivery by the device here where we use to deliver these metal clips. And uh, these clips are actually made of nitinol. So uh, for people who are familiar with cardiac stents, um, they're actually made of nitinol and they stay, oh, they stay in one's body when they're opening up blood vessels. So this is a, works in a similar fashion with trying to, uh, in the types of material they are. And um, on the right side of the diagram here, when we're, this shows the procedure layout, how we do it here. So again, putting the camera into the parts of the prostate that are obstructive, and then we deploy these metal clips out to the sides um, to, uh, um, uh, bilaterally. And, uh, and, so, and so once these are um, deployed and cinched, um, I, I call this analogy kind of like opening the, 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 the window curtains, and you basically um, get this open effect in the, in the prostatic urethra. So some considerations for, for the prostatic urethral lift is that I typically will try not to leave a catheter after this because we're not using heat or, and, and the manipulation is on the smaller side. Um, a small percentage of patients may still need a catheter, but I do give a chance uh, for people to try to urinate right away. Um, the nice thing about this procedure is there's near zero risk for sexual dysfunction because, again, we're not using heat, so not affecting the erections and really a, a, a very low near zero risk of retrograde ejaculation. Um, again, a relatively quicker recovery, about a week of taking it easy and then being able to get back to normal life relatively quickly. And again, leaves options on the table just like we discussed with, with the resume procedure. So now the last part of this uh, treatment section will be going to some of the surgical therapies. Uh, the first one is the most common surgical therapy that we use is called the TERP. Um, patients colloquially call it the rotor rooter. And basically what we're doing here is we're using a heated loop wire to really carve this tunnel, the large tunnel uh, through that prostatic urethra to get that big channel so that the bladder can empty through it. Um, this is really our gold standard um, for, for BPH. Um, this has you know, been around for at least 100 years. The first case was done in 1926, and actually before a lot of these prostate medications came on board, um, this was at one point, this was the most common outpatient surgical procedure. Um, now, there are some considerations with the TERP. Uh, it's a bloodier procedure because we're actually cutting through tissue, and, and actually the prostate is quite vascular, so uh, there can be a decent amount of bleeding. So there's a small risk of you know, bleeding to the point of needing transfusion. Um, and then uh, you know, we leave a catheter in to rest the bladder for several days. I tell people not to lift more than 10 pounds for at least a month for everything to heal properly. And there can be some, there can be some side effects, uh, for example, with bleeding and an infection and um, making sure that they're a good anesthesia candidate. Um, one, and some of the sex, one, one sexual uh, function considerations, again, with that retrograde ejaculation. I'll tell people pretty much count on having retrograde ejaculation. The, the rate is very high after this type of procedure because we're really just carving out a big tunnel there. Um, some people's erections can also get a little bit weaker afterwards. And there's also a 3% a, a chance risk of what we call stress incontinence. So it basically like you're leaking urine. You're not able to control it because of potentially... Uh, you have a residual bladder that's still squeezing very actively, or, you ha or there could have been um, some damage to the sphincter during surgery. Finally, uh, there is an, uh, there's kind of the granddaddy of operations called the, the prostatectomy, and this is basically for a very large prostate. This is, we're talking about like triple digit grams um, of tissue. And basically, it's like, if you imagine the analogy, if it was like a tangerine, we're basically removing the pulp inside that tangerine, just leaving really the, the peel behind. And that, you can imagine that's the biggest, most definitive way to leave a big tunnel through that prostate. Um, this can be done with open surgery or with a surgical robot with, to do that in a minimally invasive way. Um, the, the risks are similar to, to the TERP with the surgery in terms of 
There's a higher you know, risk for bleeding and infection, making sure someone's a good anesthesia candidate. Um, the sexual function considerations are very similar, to, again, to the TERP like we just discussed. Um, so um, that's, again, another uh, surgery technique that we can use. So in summary, you know, hopefully what you guys have learned tonight is, is learning about the prostate anatomy, uh, where it sits in the urinary system, how its enlargement can cause problems, and the ways that we can help deal with that. So anywhere from lifestyle changes to, to medications to minimally invasive treatments, and finally surgery. So there you can see there's a large spectrum of what we can do to help our patients who have uh, enlarged prostate. Um, and you know, in carefully selected patients, um, when we're looking at their whole history and overall uh, well-being, and as well as how the prostate looks on workup, I mean, some of these minimally invasive treatments can be a, a good option. And I think there's two types of patients I feel like this has really been helpful for. For, for the one, um, young, sexually active men who don't like to take medicines, don't like the side effects, uh, and they're not ready for surgery. And then the second type of patient is the older patient who has been deemed very high risk for anesthesia. They have a lot of medical problems that are going on at the same time, but yet they have urinary bother from this BPH, and uh, they were, you know, that uh, they don't want to do surgery because they, they're worried about the potential risk being too high. Um, so, you know, this, this could be also a, a, a potential place where this, these minimally invasive procedures could help them. So here are just some of my success stories um, where I've used minimally invasive procedures to help um, some of my patients with BPH. So in the first two points there, I have, I have patients in their 50s and 60s. Um, who, who were young and sexually active and didn't like taking pills uh, for BPH. And after doing a procedure like that, they were able to come off their medications and were satisfied with their urinary symptoms. I had another patient in their 60s who actually couldn't pee and was actually sticking a catheter in several times a day to be able to empty his bladder. And after this procedure, he doesn't need to do that anymore, and he's off his prostate medications. And then on the other side of the spectrum, I've had patients in their 80s you know, some of these patients were, were more unhealthy. They had, like, for one of them had, like, a very severe lung abscess that made their um, lung condition pretty high risk for anesthesia to do surgery, and they weren't able to urinate. And they had another patient who had multiple cardiac issues that the cardiologist said, well, I was, I'd be very concerned about doing a, a general anesthesia procedure. Um, and we were able to do a minimally invasive procedure and, and achieve a good outcome. Um, I think one of the most, you know, most out rewarding outcomes as a urologist is helping someone who, who's not able to urinate well um, get them through with a procedure or through medications and, and be able to have, have them pee very well afterwards. And I think that's one of the most uh, uh, gratifying things about being a urologist. I mean, being able to pee well is certainly a basic function that can be easily taken for granted. But when it doesn't work, I mean, boy, I do hear about it. People are not happy. So. All right, well, thank you very much for your time, and I'll take some questions from the audience. My information is here so that if you'd like to make an appointment with me for a personalized assessment of your urinary issues, uh, I'd be happy to see you. Uh, we also speak uh, Chinese and Spanish in the clinic, so if that is helpful, then that's also uh, available as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. Our first question this evening, are there exercises that can help with my symptoms and reduce the growth? Well, there are, the, so some of the exercises we talked about a little bit in our presentation here can be for patients if they have bothersome frequency and urgency and uh, uh, they look like they're emptying okay, we can do these Kegel exercises. So the women are familiar with these Kegel exercises because they had to practice these for childbirth. But the, the idea is to strength, you know, strengthen the pelvic muscles um, by, you know, by clenching the muscles that you use when someone's like, if you're trying to pee and someone's knocking the door and you're trying to hold your pee. Um, those are the kind of exercises you can do for those cases. Um, the other one we talked about with is purposeful double voiding, where we can, um, you know, can try to make sure that that uh, your pelvic muscles are as relaxed as possible, um, so that the you can give your your body the best chance to try to empty the urine. I mean, these exercises won't really reduce the size of your prostate, but they can help with with uh, symptom management. Next question. Are medications long-term, and how long should I take medication before considering surgery if there's no improvement? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, so these medications uh, do need to be taken on a long-term basis if they do work. I mean, if you 
were to stop, if they, these medications were to help you and you were to stop it, well then eventually your medications wash out of your system, you'll, you'll come back to, to where you were before medication. So um, that is, if, that, if that's something that the medications do help with symptoms, that's something you have to be on a long-term basis. And that's, and that's where I can sometimes, you know, we go on that spectrum of, of management where if patients are saying, you know what, I like these medications, they help me, but I don't want to take medications all the time, I don't like these side effects. That's when we start bringing up the discussion, well, do you want to consider something like a minimally invasive procedure? Do you want to do some more workup to see if maybe a surgery uh, may be uh, of, of interest? So those are ways to potentially get people off their medications because we're structurally opening that area in the prostate that's blocking the bladder up. Okay. Why can't some men have total normal urination throughout the day, but only have issues overnight? That's a good question. I mean, that, that can be, uh, that can, no, so um, that may not be, uh, be uh, and I guess, uh, let, me, let, me, let me start by saying this. I mean, that depends on the patient. I mean, sometimes patients might have a prostate issue that they're able to manage during a day, uh, but it bothers them at night. So I think what the question is referring to is a phenomenon called nocturia, where you're waking up multiple times a night. And actually, nocturia has a lot, has this list of possibilities that can cause that. So it's not just, oh, it's just the prostate making you wake up a lot. I mean, for example, that's why we look at your lifestyle. If you're drinking a lot before you go to bed for whatever reason, then you're going to be peeing a lot because, I mean, if you have a full bladder and you're just urinating a lot, and then your bladder is just doing its job. It's just you have a lot of fluid in there. There's also some medical conditions that can lead to also for people who, like your body, that your body makes more fluid that it wants to eliminate at night. And that can be some things from like, for example, congestive heart failure, people with liver failure, um, people with sleep apnea. So if you're, for example, with sleep apnea, um, people don't get enough oxygen um, because of an obstructive airway. And so your brain is constantly telling your body that it doesn't have uh, enough oxygen, so it wakes you up. And people was like, well, I'm up, I'm gonna pee anyway. So there's, I mean, there have been some very good success stories of people who are waking up like every hour and then they were diagnosed with sleep apnea and they got onto a CPAP machine and they were able to sleep, you know, soundly through the night. So that would be a symptom where I would say that, you know, it would take some uh, further work up to really know exactly what's going on. Okay. How successful is the pool procedure for patients in their 90s with moderate, moderate BPH? I am currently on medication and beginning to experience sexual impotency. So, yeah, I, I think when we're looking at whether a minimally invasive procedure is going to work. I think mean, it really takes, um, I like to look at the size of the prostate and, and the kind of the formation of the prostate. So that's where I, you know, sometimes we'll look at, we'll use what's called the cystoscopy, where I'm putting a camera in the clinic and really looking at the anatomy on the inside and seeing where those parts of the prostate uh, are blocking you up. So, you know, actually the prostate can, when you look on inside with a camera, it can actually be blocking most classically from the sides. Um, but there also can be some growth of tissue coming from below, and, um, and sometimes we can go, the prostate can grow into the bladder, and it can actually almost form its own little mound of tissue that grows into the bladder called a median lobe. Um, so so it, it's important to really understand the, uh, the size of the prostate and how, where it's being blocked up to really see if it's a, it's a reasonable consideration procedurally to do that. So, you know, if you're, if you're on your medications causing impotency and... Again, though some of these medications, that is a well-known side effect of these medications, then I think it's something that you can talk to your urologist to and see if, 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 if any of these procedures um, are, if you'd be a candidate for that. If I do not have surgery now, does it make having surgery late in it later less effective or more dangerous? So, in general, uh, if someone, I mean, looking at the objective data, if someone's emptying well in general, and there's, their urinary symptoms are generally kind of mild to moderate. Uh, I th there's probably usually not too much of a difference if you wait too long. I mean, but there can, you know, uh, there's that slide that we talked about with kind of the most serious complications of long-standing BPH. And I think one of the things I would worry about is this bladder dysfunction thing. So if one were to defer on surgery and stay on medical therapy, but they have continually, you know, uh, worsening symptoms, that could show that that bladder is just working hard, working hard, working hard over time. And you know, sometimes I warn patients if they're doing a procedure and I see uh, on assessment that this bladder looks really dysfunctional, I'll tell them, you know what, like, 
I could take care of the root of this problem, but that bladder, if it, it's not able to adjust, if it's still kind of, it could still be kind of weak or still kind of spazzy, just wants to squeeze all the time. That you could tell me that, oh, I'm able to empty okay, or my stream's a little bit better, but I still have these frequency or urgency issues, or you still, it's still weak. It could be because of long-standing bladder dysfunction. So that's one potential consideration about waiting a very long time um, from the time that you, know, you might be considering a procedure. At what age might prostate cancer appear? Well, prostate cancer typically happens, you know, at the earliest, usually 50s on. I mean, there's some very, very rare exceptions if someone has a very strong genetic history that someone in their 40s might even be at risk to get cancer. But I think typically it's 50s and onward. Um, that's why the, our, uh, the U.S. Preventive Task Force or, or actually our, our professional guidelines, for example, like the American Urology Association will recommend screening usually about after age 55. And that's kind of where we start seeing the benefits of starting to do uh, prostate screening. So that's including that PSA, that blood test that we talked about, and also you know, uh, so a doctor who can do a rectal exam and just make sure there's no obvious abnormalities of the prostate when they examine that. Um, prostate cancer actually does become more common as you get older with age. Actually, there's, um, as you, there was a study that showed that people who were over 80, if you were to do an autopsy of people who pass away after age 80, that over 80% of them would have some incidental prostate cancer uh, in the prostate. Now, this is again a little bit away from my PEPH talk, but you know, just, just, just to kind of give some detail about that, um, there are different types of prostate cancer. It's not like all prostate cancer is bad. Um, there's actually what we call like low-risk prostate cancer that actually we would classify that ca as cancer because the cells look abnormal on a morphological level, but it actually doesn't, has not been shown in studies that we've been doing for the last 10 to 20 years that it actually spreads or causes symptoms or even affects anyone's uh, qual uh, length of life. Um, so, so, you know, that's something to consider. There's, there's different kinds of cancer we call indolent cancer. And then there's things like medium and high risk cancer, which do look more aggressive and that can potentially do something over the course of, uh, several years if nothing were to be done. So again, this is a kind of an art and science that needs to be interpreted with, with, uh, urologists on board. Is there an age limit for prostate surgery? My dad is 75 years old with health issues, di diabetes being one of them. Would he be an ideal candidate for surgery? Well, no, I think, I mean, I, uh, you're looking at the, the whole patient's well-being and, and their medical conditions and how their, their heart and lungs are, that's definitely one of the considerations that we would need to take into account if we were to, for example, proceed to a procedure that required anesthesia. So that would be usually the the kind of limiting factor about how, you know, the spectrum of options in terms of how invasive one could go. So, I mean, diabetes in itself is not a contraindication, but certainly poorly controlled diabetes or very aggressive, very advanced diabetes where it's caused multi-organ failure um, or dysfunction would certainly be something we would have to consider. So it really is on a patient by patient basis. Um, I mean, and, and this is kind of goes back to my uh, points about minimally invasive therapy. There are some candidates who, if their medical health isn't great enough to go through a big surgery uh, with anesthesia, then, you know, if, if, if everything looks like on workup, that looks like it's reasonable to try something like a minimally invasive therapy that can be done without, an, without anesthesia and potentially be safer. Okay. Can a past history of kidney stones have any relationship with prostate issues developing? I'm not classically. I, 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 yeah, I'm not, I'm not aware of anything that would say if you have a history of kidney stones, you're likely to, you know, get a bigger prostate. Um, so no, I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I think bladder stones, now we're differentiating between bladder stones and kidney stones. So kidney stones form up in the kidney and bladder stones form in the bladder. So um, BPH can, you know, severe BPH, which leads to more urine hanging around, can lead to more formation of bladder stones. Um, and those, that, that the constituents of those stones can be similar to those of kidney stones, but kidney stones are usually a problem, um, up in the kidney or, you know, uh, 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 an effect of the overall health of the person. There are some, you know, so there are some conditions like, for example, with diabetes and obesity and, 
uh, a poor diet that can um, lead to increased risk of kidney stones. Um, and, you know, maybe there's a slight correlation of that leading to BPH, but I wouldn't say because you have kidney cells, you're going to get a bigger prostate. Okay. If I already had a TERP procedure nine years ago and now having symptoms again, could I be a candidate for resume? Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, uh, if you had a TERP about nine years ago, um, that's usually about the shelf life. I mean, TERP is a very good procedure, but yeah, I would say the average time of benefit, I would say, is about eight to 10 years on average. I mean, give or take several years. Um, so if you're starting to feel like some of those symptoms are coming back, it's like, man, like, I think those symptoms that got better after the TERP are starting to come back, I think that might be something to think about. And then, of course, that'd be something I would want you to come and get, you know, uh, assessed. We can do the urine studies, see how your efficiency of urinating is at the current point. I mean, sometimes I'll try people with some medications again. Uh, you know, they, like I told you guys, if after I do a minimally invasive therapy or surgery, I will stop your BPH medications. But, you know, if it's starting to grow back, I'll say, okay, let's put you on some medications again. If you start to feel like you're responding to that, then that might lead to me thinking, okay, well, if these medications are helping you after surgery, then maybe there's some more prostate tissue that can continue to open up. And so using this in patients like yourself, where you're asking that question, we can go back with a camera, that cystoscopy, and take a look and see if there's any tissue that's growing back and looks like good targets for, you know, another surgery or a minimally invasive procedure like resume. Okay, our last question for this evening. How safe is it to have a procedure done at Washington Hospital? Oh, yeah, it's, uh, we're very safe. <laughs> we, uh, we, we, are, we, we follow all the COVID protocols. I mean, we, uh, our, our hospital staff has meetings every, you know, at least every month at this point to, to review, and continually review the guidelines, and we adhere to what the CDC and the NIH are saying about COVID. So, I mean, I, I, you know, we want to make sure that the patients feel safe, that the, the physicians, physicians feel safe. So, no, and we, we are we carefully screen everybody who, who enters the hospital and in our clinics. So, you know, we, 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 uh, we, I think we are making this place a very safe place in the community. You know, we've been very active with, with outreach in the community about, uh, you know, uh, following, following the, the guidelines and also, of course, getting vaccinated. So, yes. Thank you. This concludes our program. Thank you, Dr. Shu, for your expertise. And thank you to our viewers for tuning in. The entire broadcast of this evening's event will be available on Facebook and YouTube.